All right, welcome to the Nietzsche Dialogues. I'm here with Pamela von Sabliar, and we are here to discuss Nietzsche on women. Um, this is a really controversial topic uh, among sort of the history of Nietzsche interpretation and scholarship. Um, but it's also an incredibly interesting and exciting topic. And I think one that's just as relevant uh, to the present moment uh, as it was when Nietzsche was talking about women and, and, and including women so um, explicitly into his philosophy, which I think is in some sense for um, his time and place in the history of philosophy quite unique, the way he, you know, so uh, talks about, I mean, Nietzsche in general talks about things in such a raw and alive way. Um, and, and it's no different when he's talking about uh, not just women, but men and women and the relationship between men and women. It's very much alive in his work and it's very raw uh, and and he kind of, you know, uh, holds nothing back, uh, which is another great aspect of, of Nietzsche in his work. Um, some people have interpreted Nietzsche as a feminist. You know, this, the, the range of interpretations here is enormous. Some people have interpreted Nietzsche as a feminist. Other people have interpreted Nietzsche as a misogynist um, and, and, and everything in between. So there really is uh, an overall wide range. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting to focus on in the context of Nietzsche's philosophy as a whole is that while his work is in general organized towards the overman and the concept of the overman. What's also obvious is that sexual difference between man and woman um, is very much alive in his work and relevant to this common horizon. So like my overall message here would be like, even though the common horizon is this self overcoming, Nietzsche has a view that sexual difference plays a role in how we overcome ourselves, how we engage in the process of self-overcoming, which I think is relevant to, to think about at least. Um, and in this conversation with Pamela, we're going to talk about various ideas that come up or various themes that come up throughout Nietzsche's work as it relates to our relationship with the body, hating the body, loving the body, um, the pleasures and the pains of the passions, um, chastity, uh, relations between men and women, and also marriage and reproduction. This is, I think, going to be a really spicy conversation and uh, excited to have this with you, Pamela. So um, maybe like to start us off, let's just go slowly and uh, introduce yourself and, and your background. Uh, I know we, we first met at the Emerge Conference in Berlin uh, last year, and since then we've been uh, collaborating on various topics related to your work and my work. Uh, and so... Yeah, welcome, and uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm sitting and just like reflect very briefly on what would be valuable to share when it comes to my background. And um, maybe I will just start in that I actually this morning I reread uh, some of the chapters out of Nietzsche, and uh, I could notice different parts uh, from my life journey was very present. So I think I will just start with that. I spent approximately 15 years uh, as a postmodern feminist, and uh, my passion and devotion was to um, uh, change the school system and create a more gender uh, equality pedagogic. So boys and girls were having more and equal possibilities in the school system. So I educated teachers and principals and yeah, communes all over Sweden and outside of Sweden. And I was uh, writing several books on the topic of how to support pedagogues to actually bring the science through around gender uh, equality and research and how to bring that into um, yeah, hand, hands on tools and pedagogic in everyday life. And uh, I left that. Uh, because I realized somewhere along the way that there was something missing and something that needed to be different. And, and then I spent uh, many years to um, facilitate transformative spaces, bringing all that with me and, and start to go deeper into the human psychic and uh, trying to understand more deeply what was the driving forces 
and in that facilitating and creating transformative spaces for inner development and by that also outer development and how to put this connected into um, a systemic shift to, to, to be a part of the societal shift that we can see happening in our society right now at this point. And uh, around six, seven years ago, I was through life pulled into uh, be a part of co-initiating Nordic Women's Gathering. And what I could notice that I was supposed to be at service for this, I was quite, uh, how would you say, resistant? Because I feel I've done that. <laughs> Men and women's work and feminism and like, I want to focus on humanity and humans and psychology, like deep understanding of the psychic and spirituality and and so on. And at the same time, I needed to surrender to the fact that I could notice very clearly that my intuition was like, I'm going to be here. I'm supposed to be here. And it took me a couple of years uh, when I was a part of initiating a Nordic Women's Gathering. That is, you can say it, in the start we were, it was a, be like a place to gather uh, for exploring womanhood in the 21st century. What, what does it mean to be a woman in the 21st century? Um, and uh, what was important uh, and is a part of that community is to bring different perspective of what it means to be a woman. Uh, and, and, and what does it mean and why is it important out of the times we're in? So it was not only isolated to the inner world of being a woman, it was also in relationship to men and in relationship to us, the society we live in and the paradigm shift we can see that we are part of. Part of. Uh, and, uh, and in between uh, these two, you could say like women's work or gender work or equality work or men and women work, or feminist, I will call, I, I do not call myself a postmodern feminist, I call myself post feminist, uh, whatever that means. Um, uh, I also, under this journey the last 20 years, I also have one of my deepest spiritual practices is tantric practice, and by that also the polarity practice and understanding the sexual energy and understanding that also relating to how can we move through life be being guided through something that is beyond our own intelligence and and, and that is a great and big topic by itself and i'm going to land this presentation by one of the things i'm doing today is i am facilitating intersubjective uh, spaces to have a dial to have dialogues conversations from a deeper place in our minds but also how can we create from that place and I can see clearly that there is something on the edge between men and women, the collaboration between men and women that I actually receive Nietzsche is pointing at. So I, I think it's quite interesting that you you press, you make a presentation that is raw and alive and he, he, he goes to like, he holds nothing back. I think you said it in that direction. And what I, what comes up for me when I hear you say that is like, I receive he goes to the edges to point towards that there is something more. And we can choose to get stuck in one interpretation that could be the, yeah, more, that is a woman hater <laughs> uh, or suppressing women. Or we could go to see that he has a very old way of looking at men and women, and women are more than just creating babies. Uh, or he's actually pointing towards a very, like going back 5,000 years in tantric traditions, they are pointing at the same thing. So maybe he's pointing at something very universal and maybe he was pointing us there and it has taken us, yeah, he died in the early 1900, I think, right? That's correct. Uh, and maybe he's pointing us 120-ish uh, year later to something that is important for us now because well, who, I, I'm not a Nietzsche uh, uh, I don't see myself as a philosopher at all, uh, and and I'm not a Nietzsche like expert in any way. But I understood of what I've read so far in the conversations I've had so far that many of his ideas is the foundation of the society we live in today. Uh, so it seems that he's pointing 
towards something that we haven't been able to fathom yet. But the people that I yeah, engage with, that I would say is on the edge of in a way, like uh, innovating thinking, they're like brailing that edge of like, what is that he's pointing at that wants to come back into the edge of our consciousness for be able to be a part of the foundation of a possibly next uh, society. Yeah, so I think that's, and here I get excited. I was like, whoa, I opened something. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That was beautiful. Um, and, and a great sort of like background uh, on, on your work and also a connection to, I think, uh, what Nietzsche is trying to communicate. And I think like in this, I don't think we should have any, um, you know, I've had some people on the podcast who have spent years and years with Nietzsche and have studied him academically. And I've had people on the podcast who are just sort of like coming to Nietzsche for the first time. Um, and, and, and I think that, that, that we shouldn't have any sort of like resistance to just sort of like, uh, you know, not sort of like giving our interpretation on a certain text or something like that, just because we're encountering it for the first time or something like that. So I'm really excited to, to, to actually unpack some of these ideas with someone who's, you know, playing with them in some sense for the first time and, and also like putting them into sort of like a dynamic relationship with the, the gender work that's really alive for you and on fire. And I think that's where like we can get into some really interesting conversations. Um, and uh, as it relates to sort of like the last things you were saying about Nietzsche sort of as pointing to something both universal and also something that um, is beyond what our current society can fathom at the moment, I think that is actually like the way I see Nietzsche is that he's trying to bring um, something deeper than our minds, something which, you know, you might call Eros or you might call the life force. I know in your work, um, you have a presentation on the Stoa, which talks about Eros and the life force. And I think that this is very much alive in Nietzsche's thinking as well. And this is the ancient energy that he's trying to bring back to our attention. Um, and also he's pointing to the fact that this needs to be somehow more deeply included into society, um, but that there's so much to overcome in the society in order for that to actually occur. And actually edge work is a fantastic word for it. Uh, it can also be like limit work, you know, pushing yourself to, to a certain limit where your identity feels like it's cracking or your identity feels like it's, it's falling apart. Um, and, and, and that, that, that fear that you might confront about, you know, am I going to be able to be reborn from this, limit? Am I going to be able to emerge on the other side of this? Um, and when it comes to men, women, polarity practice and sexual energy, at least in my experience, that's like the real, you know, like that's really where you, you reach the edge, you know, like, and that's really where you reach the, the limit. So, and I don't think that there, to be honest, there are too many like super deep conversations about, about the way this appears in Nietzsche. Um, so like maybe the first, uh, like, opening maybe to like discussing some of these things would be like the way Nietzsche talks about the body. He has this passage in Thus Spoke Zarathustra where he's talking about the despisers of the body, um, the people who uh, he says, you know, uh, you should bid your body farewell if you, you know, d despise your body. He's sort of like has this idea that the soul is the body. Um, and like he tries to get rid of any dualism between the soul and the body. And I think this is really important to start with because how much of philosophy or how much of our intellectual work is a type of secret despising of the body? Like the way I would maybe like want to open up that question to you is how do you imagine your own transitions as a woman through being, you say, okay, I was a postmodern feminist and now I'm a post-feminist. How much of that has a relationship to what Nietzsche is talking about, about despising the body and like seeing the body and the soul as one thing? Because that's like one of the things that like really screams at you in some of those passages. Mm. Oh. Yeah, I can notice there is several perspective that opens up here when you ask that question. And, then, and the first, I'm just, if I'm just gonna start responding like concretely, if I look at myself as a young postmodern feminist, um, 
I fighted my own body. Like I fight, I despaired and fighted my own body. I did not respect my period, like my bleeding, my cycle. I did not see myself as a psychic being. I was looking at myself as being able to uh, perform and achieve exactly the same way uh, every day. And I couldn't even see myself as less strong than a man, for example. Like, so my body was out of uh, and the view I had a problem. <laughs> if I look at it today, it's my source to the divine. Um, and that's just such a big <laughs> leap. Uh, <laughs> and like, <laughs> if I look at when I carried my daughter 25 years ago, I looked a little, I talked about myself that I rented a room in my body out and that was it. <laughs> I was so disconnected. And when I, now I, my daughter is 25 and just got her first child as a daughter uh, and, and maybe the last, I don't know that. And I can see how she has been inhibited. Like she's been taken over by this child since like month two. So she needed to surrender uh, to, to be totally taken by another life form in her body. Uh, and she wasn't not, like, so it's just so two different worldviews and respecting what she needed out of that. So, and for me, there is also really becoming something else or something more. The body has been such, uh, almost I would say, like, it's been a sacred relationship to bring back for me becoming something more than my psychic was when I was 25. Like all the trauma I had, like all the dissociation, disconnection, the journey has been going back into my body. And as better and better I become to be deeply connected with my body, more open I have been to something that is bigger than myself, whatever, whatever one I name that to. So, And I can, I, I, and I can also see that, like in intellectual, as you were pointing at, uh, context, how there is a value of, you could say, also like spirituality that was more transcendent, and you're meditating, you're leaving your body, and intellectual and philosophical conversations, and 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 rejecting, like uh, rejecting the body as something that's peasant, that's more animalistic, it's more earthy and actually how also spirituality is in a way saying we can't go any further with not including the body as sacred and 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 from there bringing all of our humanness as like integrated and from there we can start to transcend into something that is still like divinity in a human form and, and i think that's maybe uh if you use nietzsche's word like a over man like that's where we become something more or there's in the integral like in Ken Wilber, I think he speaks about the superhuman like that's but but we can't take that leap over but I think that's also connected to the, the separation that our worldview of this reality is like our society is resting on that worldview of separation and that is to be separated from nature from body uh so yeah that's so I think Nietzsche is pointing us at something, yeah, already then, because that was, yeah, we were in modernity then, right? In his, I don't, I, I'm not totally yeah. sure. Yeah, well, he's he's specifically addressing Christian society. I think, like, if, if you could say, like, one thing he's addressing, like, mm -hmm. it's Christian society and it's a metaphysics of a mm -hmm. transcendence, which is in an other world. You know, like, mm. so like the idea, like I, you know, like I, I've often told the story about my grandmother who was a Mormon and who thought that she would, uh, you know, when she died, she would go to heaven. And then like, you know, you would get your divinity and your joy on the other side, mm. like in a, in a, in an idealized body, but not this body. It's sort of like seeing this body as, um, mm. just a, you know, an animalistic vessel, which is imperfect and which, which is problematic and which is you know, Nietzsche always emphasizes covered in shame and guilt. And, 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 and so like, 
the, like the, what I would want to like first sort of connect this to in regards to you're saying, you know, when, when you were a postmodern feminist, you were fighting your own body. Um, is that one of the ideas of the overman is really that it's connected to self overcoming. Mm -hmm. And in that context, it's like, you know, maybe we could say like an aspect of postmodernism is this self over, you know, this need to overcome the self, because like literally you have this conception of the self, which is against what you are like against the body, like, you know, fighting your cycles fight, you know, and like for, for men, like I've had similar, like for myself, I, I've had sort of a similar uh, experience or a similar sort of uh, being covered in shame uh, or being covered in, in guilt about my sexual energy or how, how I express it or how I talk about it, or uh, maybe a certain aggressivity of my drive or like one thing, like I really felt with my family was like, um, that I'm too excessive or like I'm too, too much or something like that, that I have to hide myself or that I have to, you know, and so I think we can all feel this way maybe when we really connect with the body and we really connect with whether it's menstrual cycles or, or whatever it is that, that something of, you know, what's like implied in so much of our society is that we have to take a, a, a perhaps a divine part of ourselves uh, and, and, and hide it, hide it away. And I think that that's sort of like um, anyway, what 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 Nietzsche is really coming up coming up against. And um, I also like the way you made this distinction between intellectual and spiritual work, um, kind of being an attempt to leave your body, um, and that we can only get so far with that view, like that somehow divinity needs to include um, the naturalistic. Um, could you speak maybe a little bit about how you view that in your current work, like including the divinity with the body, uh, in relationship to like how maybe you, you used to see it? Mm. Yeah, but there is just a, I would just like to, to add on something you just said, because you, you pointed at Christianity and I'm just like, yes, of course, Christianity wants us to get out of the body because that's the, as I, if, if that is, in my experience, that's how I see it. That's my worldview today. It is a connection point to the divine. So it also cuts off, cuts, cut us off from life force to truly be guided by life, like to, to, to be able to guide it by something that is bigger than our own uh, intuition or even our own mind. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just think that religious perspective is quite interesting of looking at how church actually want us to get away from our body and our connection to the higher to be able to be in church and listen to an authority that were pointing us in a direction of instead of we being in connection with the divine uh so i i think that's quite interesting and also when you say like the postmodernist of overcoming self or overcoming body but it's also about overcoming postmodern sexuality because it's quite immature <laughs> it's like really yeah you have the right to do everything and you're free with your sexuality and that's amazing and it becomes very teenagey but when you get past that like more primal animalistic and just getting rid of all the shame around sexuality and really becoming free that's where i see that you come to a point of really in deep discernment uh, of like, where should I put my sexual energy? Like both like in a sacred union as in a relationship, uh, no matter if I'm monogamous or if I am polyamorous, how are my containers? Like how, what are they contained? Like hermetic contained, no matter if it's with one person or it's a field of people, but they are contained. So they are like, there is like coherence. So there is purity. There is like, so we can channel the life force to support us to transcend into something like over i'm gonna use nietzsche's word like uh overman or overhuman and also uh if i my sexual energy my life force energy do i put them into a purpose where, where do i devote it like in my alignment with my integrity my values uh with uh, uh with what the world needs of me or us right now to show up for because what is yeah where there is error in the system and we need to provide for it so it's also like for me that is also a yeah a valuable 
because we're still postmodern. <laughs> like the postmodern culture is just like becoming mainstream. And we are also in the, a total deconstruction of that and a, a new paradigm is arising. And I think that's perspective that's valuable for us to bring with overcoming postmodernity and when it comes to sexuality and life force and collaboration between men and women, it is truly about, yeah, coming to a next level with it that is not a teenager level. Nothing wrong with that. We have to live out that. But there is a next yeah. level of maturity and that is calling for us right now. Uh, as I see Absolutely. It. And I love the way you're juxtaposing the Christianity versus the postmodernism sort of. Um, they are kind of weird opposites and like maybe examples of just how deep the problem is because we'll seem to construct any worldview that prevents us from actually maturely confronting the actual issue of self-overcoming in, in some ways. Um, and I do see postmodern sexuality as kind of like in some ways a weird opposite of like the Christian repression. You know, so like on the one hand, you'll have the Christian, you know, the idea that like the traditional, maybe like specifically like the, the Abrahamic religions, but maybe religion in general as a type of repressive force on our sexual energy. And so there's this trade off between sort of our life force and our body energy and like sort of the demands of civilization. So like, you know, you have to sacrifice all of what you really are for the demands of civilization and, and stuff like that, where in postmodernism, there seems to be this you know, there's no container. So you like, you go from like an absolute container, which is very repressive to like no container where you're like free to do whatever you want. And both of those two extremes kind of miss, I think the deeper point, which, which Nietzsche tries to get at. And I think that that like brings us to another passage that might give us another window um, into what that is, is like, um, he has this passage about basically the passions and the relationship between pleasure and pain. Um, and he talks about, um, interestingly, how it's kind of like, if we just try to go for the good um, without really confronting the depths of the passions, we can kind of have like a, a pseudo good or a false good. Whereas um, he gives this sort of view that in order to really become the overman and really to create what he calls loving virtues we need to turn our most evil drives or our most primitive drives into the highest virtues it's kind of like the soil out of which they grow like he gives this sort of like um sort of impression of like you know uh dogs in the cellar becoming singing birds and devils becoming angels like this sort of like metamorphosis and stuff like that and i think that that sort of connects to what you were saying about like it's okay to go through the primal animalistic stage of like having free sexuality and getting rid of shame and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's kind of like how you learn from that process of like having a sort of free open sexuality and sort of not being too concerned about containers, but then bringing attention to this deep discernment you talk about, um, a deep discernment about sacred, you know, could be sacred union. Um, it could be basically how am I constructing this container towards cultivating a higher virtue beyond myself or something like that? So like maybe the question I would, I would have for you is um, how did you relate to this idea of like sort of a metamorphosis between the more primal, what he calls evil motives and like the higher virtues sort of like cultivating that, like, you know, have, have you had a sort of relationship with a metamorphosis of that, of that type? Yeah, I would say um, I see it go for several different parts of ourself. Like I, I can see that. And it also goes for, I don't know what, if I would start with like, we live in a society of addiction. Like we, we, we use a lot of stimuli to get away from the emptiness of the reality we live in or the separation itself. So like, whatever we are addicted to in a way is a possibility to come back home and saying, okay, if I live out this addiction or I'm getting clarity around what is this addiction and then saying, how can this be transformed to something that is beyond, uh, it's just a cycle of repeating and, and how to say 
degrading, like it's going down. But I would say also sexuality is, for me, a point of how I could see my sexuality was oppressed. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I brought up with a Catholic mother. So, and, and, and it was, she was very, men and women are very, very equal until it came to my brothers and my sexuality. <laughs> then we were not equal anymore. <laughs> Then I, then I, he was a yes, a young man becoming young boy becoming a man, and I was a slut. <laughs> so and I was just, I, and I was just like, huh, what the fuck happened? <laughs> that is not fair. <laughs> so, but that so I needed to go through a place of uh, oppressing of my own sexuality and all the shame that was a part of that, and the 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 archetype of me having this like mother and slut, like mother and whore inside of myself. And then playing that out with the men that I was interacting with, and then coming to a point of going to a phase where I need to go into the, my wild parts and the primal parts and just allow myself to find my sexuality and to find myself and live out whatever I needed to live out in fantasies and desires to be able to really find some kind of sovereignty in, ah, this is my sovereign self. This is sexuality on our next layer that is so much more meaningful and profound and mystical and divine and then realizing the distinction point between there's a prime in sexuality and there is a, a, a sexuality that I'm more called maybe you could call it like sexual energy divine and it's very interlinked and they're not the same and understanding when the how the primal works and works through me and and how I can contain that and uh, I can be in becoming uh, how would you say I'm in charge of that it's there but I'm in charge of it it's not oppressed or suppressed in me uh, but I decide but not in a way of saying it's not there but acknowledging it for how it works but then saying how I would like to relate to it and how I want it to, to act out. And then being very clear of what is actually a sexual energy, creative energy, life force energy, uh, how is that connected to uh, uh, the bigger cycles of life? How is that connected to divinity? How is that connected to purpose? And how is that connected to the mystery? Um, so, and how the sexual energy, I I can actually transcend my psychic uh, with it. Uh, and together with someone else, then there is even greater possibilities. And how can this life force energy, sexual energy, be taken out of the sexual context? I can, if we would say about intimate space in the bedroom, how can it be taken out and something we can work with uh, as colleagues, as a, a society, as a humanity, uh, what is the potential there that, um, yes, if we go back and read the old uh, wisdom traditions, there are pointers and profound wisdom, and I also receive that something new wants to come forward from that edge. Uh, and now maybe I've, I've become to out there but and i don't even know not at all not at all so but i but i can just see that if if i just take the, the tantric perspective for example it's very much and very often talked about two people deciding to walk the path of enlightenment the path of transcendence together to embody love and by having the container of two uh, there is a possibility to be awakened to your own psychic through the mirroring of the other and then doing the, the 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 deeper sexual work or working with the sexual energy and using that energy to transcend the physical body and by all also our, our psychic and to transcend into a more conscious being. And I see that what seems to be calling from the emergent end edge of what's possible for us humans to step into is actually as groups working with this energy and transcend our group psyche and our group body uh, and the culture we work in and 
how we can point that energy into creation uh, and creativity. So, so actually becoming vehicles, a group vehicle uh, that works from source. And from source, that for me is from life force energy. Uh, and I think Nietzsche is pointing towards that. And that's what I, I receive he's pointing at when he points to be able to hold pleasure and pain is transcending your psychic to die, uh, die into death. As I we say, live life fully. Yeah, live death fully. <laughs> it's both. Like live pain fully, live pleasure yeah. fully. So I also have seen, seen like transcending like my relationship to pleasure, like not hunting pleasure, not uh, detach, like t attached to pleasure, cling to pleasure, but fully enjoy pleasure when pleasure is here. Like, and really allow myself to be like, ah, oh, like that becoming so fully alive by looking at a sunset or smelling uh, like flowers or eating chocolate or, do you know, just the pleasure of being alive. Oh, and when I speak into it, like it touches me so deeply. And also like the pleasure of death, like, like the pain, because pain is calling for attention. Like if you see pain as something that is just calling for attention. So it is like, it is like there is something that wants to be let go of in pain. And how can I die into pain? How can I be with pain without dwelling in it without suppressing it running away from it but just being with it until it's gone and see what comes from there so so that's also like a a different relationship like pain before i try to reject <laughs> and be in denial of and suppress and today i'm like ah oh, I allow myself to feel it fully in every cell of my body. And then when I cannot, I take a break because when it's too much for my nervous system and I can't enhance the pain, I'm allowing myself to dissociate or take a break for a moment or whatever and then give space so I can feel it again. And there I can notice in my psychic, it's like, wow, and then I hit a new edge. And, and there I start to become something new. So that's, I don't know if I respond to your question, but that's also like- Oh yeah, gorgeously. Yeah, like something that's really changed for me when it comes to pain and pleasure. Like that's really to be able in my psychic to go to a space where I can become the process of birth, death, rebirth. Mm -hmm. ah, and, I, and I, when I speak it out, I, I feel it so much here in my heart space. It's like, because there, and maybe that's, what you just said, and I think Nietzsche is pointing at, you know, when you become the higher virtue, like the virtue of the heart, like the spiritual heart, that's what I call it. But like when I can feel, yeah. I can feel I got that coming in to my system when I speak, I can feel love coming in. It's a, it's a deep sense of love for life. Exactly, and, yeah. And it includes all of it. This is this reality. Like that's, so when transcending I don't know if I used the word right, but there's something more that wants to be said. Like, by being able to embrace like the circumstances of this reality, that's where I transcend into divinity, like on yeah. earth, like in this body, in this flesh, in here. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what comes. I trust that. <laughs> it's profoundly beautiful. It's like profoundly beautiful. And now, and now in this moment, I can notice like everything gets light, like more clarity and more light. I get more expansion over my like over this, and I say like, ah, and I say like, ah, oh, yes, yeah, it's beauty. Yeah, you definitely. I mean, I think you definitely more than answered the question. And and what what what's coming up for me? I mean, there's many things coming up for me, but one of the things that's really coming up for me powerfully is that when you situate this idea that Nietzsche talks about, about sort of like the metamorphoses of evil into good and like really working with the passions um, and accepting all of the passions, like you're saying, the pain and the pleasure and stuff like that, um, life and death, you know, living life fully, living death fully, you know, living pleasure fully, living painfully, 
Um, um, oftentimes our psyche is split in that way as well into a, into a dualism. Like you were also saying is like, I'm just going to become attached to pleasure and I'm going to try and avoid pain. And that's, I think a very infantile response. And I think that's sort of how the infant mind works. Um, but consequently, as a result of living in a society like that, I think we, we are living in a society of addiction um, and, and a society of I isolation where we become sort of isolated with our little addictions to pleasure. And, and it sort of cuts us off and narrows us um, because we sort of lose the capacity to share our whole spirit with uh, others. And ultimately, like I think what you were pointing to is like the need to probably work with this as individuals um, work with this as couples and work with this as a group. And, and, and I, and, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think from what I know, there are some people who are working on that level, but there's very few, and it's certainly not a cultural phenomenon. Like for example, um, yoga and meditation in some sense have gone mainstream in our society, you know, like people doing yoga routines after work, uh, meditation is kind of like a very common, uh, even like a um, sort of embraced practice by corporate, uh, by corporate ethics and stuff like this. But Tantra is seen, Tantra is still very marginal. Tantra is still seen, like it is practiced and it is practiced on like the individual, the couple and the group level but it's not like a social phenomenon, you know, like I think what would be really interesting and potentially that's where our various uh, thought communities are tending is what if Tantra became as mainstream, so to speak, as yoga and meditation are, I think it would, it would point in the direction of what I think what you're, what you're saying of like the need to work with this energy on a group level to like, it's one thing to overcome yourself. It's another thing to overcome within a couple. And then yet another thing, I think, to work with it on the society scale, um, and which is a whole other challenge, right? Like, so, yeah, I mean, what's coming up for you with that? Like the idea that like what Nietzsche is maybe pointing towards is this like tantric scale society in some sense. I know your work kind of touches on it in various ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What comes up is like um, a society on that level, it will be um, an eros positive society. It will be a regenerative society, a life affirming, life giving society. And before I just keep on going there, because you pointed at about we live in like a society of addiction, or but we also live in a society of trauma. Like, because because when you say like it's an infantile infantile way of of viewing, and I can see that so deeply, my own deep trauma work has been such a crucial part for me to be able to come to the space of not separate and and use pleasure and pain of opposite as opposite, but actually be able. So what if when we are <laughs> in the worldview of wholeness, because we're pack animals, we are deep human connection is a birthright of ours, connection to nature, connection to something that is bigger than us. What if that's our birthright? And when that is so, we are able to hold the paradox of pain and pleasure as a part of this reality, because that's what we designed for, because this reality, life on earth, nature is pain and pleasure. Uh, it's both and it's death and and birth and rebirth. So what if our psychic hinder us from actually experience our true divine nature? Uh, that is a very like as as just before, and I'm coming to that place in myself. It's like fuck, everything is love and everything is just joy, and you know it's it's a state of being that is so profound that I that. As I became a grandmother 11 weeks ago, and when you look into a newborn's eye, that's what you see. It, it is so much love and so much connection and joy. And yeah, so yeah, I'm just, 
I'm, I'm taking a detour, but it's just, I think it's an important part of understanding addiction and our society and and our incapacity of holding pain and pleasure with an open hand and death and birth and rebirth as a part of a living process. And trauma is a part of that. Uh, and uh, a society where we would allow ourselves to have a tantric society and in one way you can bring out one core word because tantra is a a profound wisdom tradition and and have a lot in it but if you take one to make it very concrete and simple is to allow what lives through you authentically live through you to embrace everything no matter if, if it's dark or light good or bad pain or pleasure to fully embrace it so how would it look with a society where we actually can embrace birth death and rebirth how would a society look like? Because it's also about polarity. It is about this sexual energy, cre creative energy, life force energy. What would it look like when a man and a woman come together in our society where polarity is in place and we can ha use that as a creative trampoline, you know, for even more creativity, for be able to be even more connected to the source of creation and allow us to be vehicle for creativity and allowing us to be able to listen deeply to that i would say pull because that's how i receive the the evolution impulse of error it pulls us it attracts us it bring it takes our curiosity it enliven us it lifts up and allowing us to respond to that to be attentive to it and respond to it to be receptive to it yeah, uh, I don't have any answers for how that would look like. I, I could just no, say that. of course, I and I don't think yeah. No, I I just have a deep philosophy <laughs> of yeah. Wow, because I, I don't know, think we can. I don't think we can because we're working with a certain very intense energy. I don't think we could predict exactly what it would look like. No, 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 and I know, <laughs> I know. If I would describe my own just intimate love life, sex life before my tantric awakening and after, holy smoke. And I think there are parallel or perspectives you can bring out of that to uh, on a society level. Mm. And, and yeah, I don't know why, but it comes up for me, uh, the, the, the chapter of chastity, because it has, has something to do with yes. uh, the sexual energy and the life force energy, because Maybe. it is powerful. Maybe let's yeah let's let's talk about that then because that naturally blends into the, to like you said it naturally blends to this talk about chastity, um, and uh, just to give like a, a a quick quick meditation here, um about man and woman polarity in place and like say love before and after the tantric awakening I think like when we're talking about the three possible scales of the the tantric work or like the really what what that means I think is working with your own body's energy um and 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 transforming it towards a virtuous holistic connection to the rest of the world um i think it is important to sort of emphasize um that i think this should be done in a type of um like a, a, a there's a certain logical progression to it namely like working with it with it as an individual working with it as a couple and working with it as a group like if you haven't worked with it as an individual, then working with it as a group would be kind of counterproductive potentially because it could be even further traumatizing because like you don't really know the energy in your own body. So how could you accept everything that's in the other's bodies and, and, and society as a whole? Um, but the, the point about this connection with chastity, I think is really interesting because the way I interpret Nietzsche's um, meditation on chastity is that... Um, that what he's getting at is that what people are really motivated by is this deep sensual desire to be connected with an other. Like it could be a man with a woman or a woman with a man. Like that you say you're motivated by one thing, which is non-sexual, but what you're really uh, motivated by is this 
deep sensual desire to connect with the other. Like he says, let me give the exact quote. He says, the bitch of sensuality leers with envy out of everything they do. You know, so like, it's like this, this sensual image, this thing, it's like this, this monster inside of them. Like there's this monstrous force inside of them, which is controlling everything they do. And what he basically advises people to in this section on chastity is an innocence of the senses. So like, you, like the, the, like the overall, like sort of meta theme that I get, at least from thus spoke Zarathustra is there's this monstrous passion inside of us and we have to approach it with a deep innocence. Like we have to approach it with the innocence of the child. We have to like, we have to look at this monstrous energy with the same eyes that you were talking about in that newborn, you know, like the newborn's eyes of like innocent, an innocent awakening, you know? Um, and that, you know, he ultimately says that people who are actually chaste, um, they're mild of heart, they laugh gladly and richly, and they even ask themselves, what is chastity? In other words, he's trying to, he's trying to get at the idea that for the people who are really chaste, it's not like a disciplinary restriction. It's because they, it's because they have the, the thing they want inside of them already in some sense, you know, so they laugh loudly, they're mild of heart, they're, they're in, in this sense. So um, how did you relate to this like meditation on chastity and and I don't think in any way he's trying to say like, we shouldn't sort of engage in intimate relations. I think he's more saying, can we engage in intimate relations from a more innocent, childlike, playful space? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what I, some, some ideas I take from it. Uh, one, uh, one thing that comes up for me is like, what I hear he said is say is be wise. Like when he, when he points at chastity, he says, be wise uh it's a strong energy uh like only the primal sexual energy is a strong force and the sexual energy the life force the creative energy is i would say the stronger force and if you haven't gone through the cycle of not clinging on to your pleasure or not be awake to your own ad addictive nature uh you can be taken by it and it can ruin you and your life and others. And what if that deep desire, sensual desire to be connected to the other is not just the other as another man or another woman or a woman if you, uh, you're into women, is actually to the other as something that is beyond the human nature. Uh, so, so when we connect to that evolution impulse of Eros, and we are not in sovereignty in our sexuality, we're not in our sovereignty in our maturity of relationship to pleasure and like trauma addiction, all that, it can take us and it can destroy us <laughs> uh, in, in so many different ways. So, and, and if you have, that's what I, I receive when he points at this with chastity, a person is already chaste, you know, it's not because you know out of your wisdom that like, chastity is not about i looked it up like i went into like really to some word when i was reading the the, the, the chapters today i reread it I, I read it put out because the english is not my native tongue so i was like i'm really gonna go to the root of every word that i see it's like it's more important i, I could just energetically feel like okay this word should be more explored and chastity doesn't mean absent of uh, uh intimacy or sexuality it, there is a definition that says a right amount of uh, sexual energy. So, so, and what if, if we look at church and monastery and chastity, what it was never about oppress or suppress, what if it's about practicing uh, and, and, and deeply understanding the alchemy and the, the right amount of sexual energy and where to guide it? Should I direct it into family? Uh, or should I direct it to, to in service of something that is uh, higher or beyond, like more spirituality, if you would say so. So I, I, I think there are like, uh, and also, like, I also like, I look to do like chastity and also like hermetic seal, like how do I seal a container? So I actually are using that amount of, um, yeah, sensuality or 
sexuality in, in the right way to something that is higher. Um, yeah, so, th so that's what it evokes for me in it. It's beautiful. And, and um, I specifically like your emphasis on that chastity doesn't necessarily mean the absence of sexuality. And I think that's also like what I get in, in Nietzsche's like, he, he, he says actually that, you know, when people interpret chastity through the lens of it means no sexuality, and it means sort of like this absolute repression, he says that that becomes a vice. You know, like you try to, you think sexuality is a vice or you think passion is a vice. So you try to lock it up. Mm -hmm. And then he says that becomes a vice. <laughs> you know, so, so I, he, I think he's, he is trying to get towards uh, this, which is, is, is a dialectical perspective on the relation to this energy and, and how do you direct it? How do you direct it towards um, a beyond? I mean, for me, I think I did direct it in an intellectual way in my PhD. I often say my PhD thesis was my baby. So it's like a metaphor for like, a, I'm pregnant in my writing process and, and, and stuff like that. So it's like sort of a direction towards a beyond. But my PhD thesis as such didn't involve an other person. Like mm -hmm. it's just a book. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think like the really deep tantric work, it requires sublimating that sexual energy with other people in the context of a group as we've been pointing towards so like family or monastery life or some sort of other type of community um maybe like for example you do the work with the nordic women's gathering that could be a type of group work which is a sublimation of that energy beyond yourself and i think that that really leads nicely into sort of the developmental lens or the intergenerational lens of this topic of sexuality because sexuality as you sort of said many times is the life force it's the creative energy it's literally where new life comes from um and so like i feel like it's important to talk about where we are in our developmental trajectory and like how that affects how we use that energy and sometimes if we don't think about that too much i think we can misuse it in a developmental context or we can misuse it in an intergenerational context mm -hmm. um so there's this 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 um passage in in thus spoke zarathustra where he speaks on women to to an to an older older lady and there's many passages in that section where he's um he says many things which are highly controversial and 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 like have provoked a lot of uh, different interpretations one of the interesting things he says is that Everything about a woman is a riddle with one solution, pregnancy, um, and <laughs> which is which is an interesting way to, way to think about it. But when you think about it in a developmental context, what does this how does this land for you and how do you interpret what he's trying to say here? And, and, and maybe in, in sort of, yeah, in, in your context of like having been a mother, seeing your daughter become a mother and, and how that transforms our identity. Yeah, that, that, that chapter was one of the chapters, like, I really had my, my early 20-year-old feminist on my shoulder when I was reading it. That was a chapter that I would be, <laughs> I, I would disagree deeply uh, with that chapter, um, um, yeah, more than 20 years ago. And today, I, like, if I look at, I could just take that very concrete example. I've been, I've been, have, I've had the great possibility to be very close to my daughter the last five months, the three last months of her pregnancy, and now the three first months of her as a mother. And um, just listen to how she talks about that transition from maiden to mother, like the archetypical transition. And uh, and this is not words that she usually talks, talks, she doesn't usually use these words, but she's been saying like, Becoming a mother, it's an ego death. Like I'm totally dissolving into this life. <laughs> and whatever I was before is not there. I know it's there somewhere, but it's it it's there's no room for it right now. And and she does it with a great elegancy. Like she like gracefully, she does like she it's not that it's not painful in moments, but she has created circumstances around her that she can allow herself to 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 be taken by that process and 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 she can say things as um 
she can look at it and she's a very like she's a high skilled woman she's a she's very intelligent she has like a like a education she has a, a big dream for her future and so on and she looks at this baby and she looks at me and she's just like life has become so deeply meaningful just because of this life <laughs> so i i can see in a way that uh, and I, I can deeply relate, even if I couldn't embrace it the way I can witness her doing it when I was becoming a mother myself, but I can relate out of where I'm standing today that her life purpose is in a way filled because of this child. And I can see as a grandmother, when I look at my daughter and I look at how she is responding to that granddaughter then the meaning of my life is even more enhanced because i very often say that my parenthood is one of the things that has been most meaningful in my in my life and I also i work and i've always done and do what i love and so on so there is a, a deep core truth that we transcend in our motherhood you could say we we do our spiritual journey by becoming mothers in a way that many men do not have access to. Um, and I can see that in one way you could say she hasn't had a choice of not transcending. As if I look at her partner, I, that he have had the possibility to get away. <laughs> He's not feeding the child with, in, with his own body. He has not been taken over by this creature for 10 months, you know, <laughs> and not be able to sleep and not be able to do what you used to do, not be able to eat and drink what you want to eat and drink. Like it's that maturity that it requires to give yourself over to something that is bigger than yourself. The man has a different journey on it. Uh, and right now, absolutely. I can... absolutely. Yeah, Sorry. absolutely. I, I, I think that this is one of the, the great um one of the great disappointments i have in our modern education system and especially like the sexual education i mean maybe this can be somehow related to your journey as well but like the sexual education specifically is like the the way in which it fails to teach us about how confronting this specific dimension of life um structures and changes our psyches um and and like you said like it like well you just said like when your daughter has the child, it looks as though like she just has a meaningful, like she says, my life is just meaningful because of this child. That all of our meaning and all of our purpose comes from, um, or at least a great deal of our meaning and purpose comes from this specific dimension of life. And life can quickly become empty without it, of course. Um, but that our current education system and sexual education in, in particular doesn't teach us about the way in which this is radically different for the man and the woman. Like, yeah, like if my partner were to have a child, the asymmetry is so obvious. I mean, the child is not growing inside my body. The child, I, I do not go through that same struggle as a nine month, 10 month process. I do not go through that struggle with the actual birthing process itself, which I've heard many people describe as like a death, like where you're actually giving birth and it's like, you know, how do you get out? You can't get out of that. Like you're in that, like you're going through that. And then there's also this radical asymmetry with the desire and the nature of the baby and the relationship to the mother. Like in, especially in the first weeks of life, that baby is going to want to be closer to the mother than with the father. If the father's relevant at all, perhaps, I mean, perhaps maybe a little relevant, but maybe totally irrelevant. Um, but in regards to this deep core truth, how, you know, as it relates to, you know, meaning and as it relates to organizing the other aspects of our life. Um, and on like on the woman's side, I can imagine you giving some interesting wisdom about how, how we might incorporate this deep core truth. I think from the man's side, one of the things that comes up in my head is um, how does the man incorporate a similar level of maturation 
that the woman almost seems to get by virtue of going through the process itself, you know, like, like babies, like say, for example, just before I pass it on to you, like say, for example, you have two, a man and a woman who are both relatively immature, meaning they're not really willing to give up themselves for another life and, and, and work for something beyond themselves. In the process of pregnancy, the woman might be more sort of predisposed to going through a deep maturation just by virtue of the fact that she's gone through pregnancy. And like, you know, how do we also do this, do this for men? This is like one of my, one of the ideas that's coming to my head, but like, how would you say, like to throw it back to you, how, how would you say we incorporate this deep core truth of, of pregnancy and confronting pregnancy with meaning in relationship to some of the things that you've been involved in with sexual education in the modern world? Like, and in my experience, it's kind of been removed this deep core truth. It's almost like postmodernism has removed this truth. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> and I, and I can notice here now. It's like, oh, I can I can notice all uh, all the postmodern arguments that could come in, like in this conversation. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like, should I should I mention this? Like, and, and I'm just gonna make it. A I'd say men, mention them. Mention mention all the different possibilities of interpretation. Yeah, I, I I also sit with the perspective that the postmodern has taken away core truth about men and women uh, that actually it's not serving us. Uh, and this is something that I wouldn't say 25 years ago, but I will I say it today because I hold a different truth. Like 25 years ago when me and my ex-husband became parents to our first child, and that was our daughter. Like, I held the story that we were totally equal, there were no difference between us, and we should show up exactly the same for the child. And when I look at it today, I am like, I ruined something that was, that I ruined a potential that was there And it took away something very, how would you say, both, I would say, primal for, from our children. I have one daughter and one son. We took away a primal intelligence for them to be able to witness just because we are a female animal and a male animal, we do have some specific intelligence in our system. And we took that away from our children to be able to witness that and to have that. Um, how do you say when you see something, then you also have it in your own system. It's like we took that away. Children imitate. Yeah, exactly. So, so like, like this imitation function. Yeah. So we took that away. And we also took away their possibility to see a healthy functional polarity between a man and a woman that that is both out of like i would say on an energetic level and a psychological level and just like also i would say be able to see how a wholeness of a system work like i think nietzsche pointed this when he talks about marriage like when two people come together and sacrifice to become something bigger together for something else. Like by taking away that healthy, both animalistic navigate gravity point of being a man and being a woman and the psychology that comes with that and the polarity, we took away a wholeness from a whole system. Because if we say that we as parents are the first group that our children is witnessing, even if it's a very, very small group, but, but they also are included, so they are also part of the group. So it's almost like they see that what is a failure in our society, our system as a society, we took that away from our children to be able to be a part of that experience and witness that experience. I don't know if this makes sense. I haven't worded like this before, so I'm actually try talking. No, I think it's super important what you're saying, and I want I want you to continue, but just quickly, yeah. like maybe what, what, would, what would help is that um, at least the way I, I make sense of it is like, what most people think of as wholeness 
requires no polarity or asymmetry. But actually, if you take away the polarity and the asymmetry, you lose the wholeness. So like the wholeness requires the polarity and the asymmetry. So what most people think of as an obstacle or a barrier to wholeness, namely the polarity and the asymmetry, is actually the very thing that needs to be injected back into the system that actually brings wholeness. It's like, it's a weird way of thinking about the whole. Wholeness is about the capacity to hold diversity and difference without yeah. fragmentate. That's, that's, that's from, and that's where coherence, true coherence appear. Uh, that's what I, yeah. Thank you for making that distinction. That's important. So what do I mean with that? Like if I make it really core simple, I was like, what if just by the design of my body, like my biology design of my body, I can give life, no matter if my uterus are working or not, or or my womb is working or not, no matter if I ever will give birth to a child or not, but through my design as a woman, I give life. So that, that that's like, and you could, and you can, in one way, you, if you talk about tri tribe, tribal society, you talk about fem women are, like gatherers and i know this is a very simplified form but it it contains a core energy and men they're hunters they're the outer circle uh, they are pro protecting and providing life and 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 that's where if women's transcending experience just out of our biology is to give life to carry life to give to go through birth and to nurture life then man uh, where man can do his, the other, <laughs> is to care for the system, the group, the family, the woman, the child, to provide and to protect. Like, so by taking that away, that core essence of true in our biology, because I was denying that uh, and didn't see it like that, uh, we're taking away a fundamental polarity and also like the, the fundament of, of, of the man um, doing that journey, <laughs> like to, to care for something that is bigger than him. And, and that, is, that is the woman and the child, the group, the society, uh, the purpose. Uh, so. That, that actually came up in one of our collaborations related to the dark feminine that I, ex I actually expressed something like that, that I felt like when this polarity is taken away, it takes away kind of, it makes me feel like if I'm in the mode of providing and protecting that I'm potentially even oppressing or something like this, you know, so it does take away, it, it, it makes us, I think for both the man and the woman, it, it creates an idea that if we follow our, the logic of our own system and the logic of our own energy, that we're in some sense um, doing wrong, like, like, like the, we're in the wrong, and I guess that takes us back to, to original sin with the body and stuff like that. But like that we're, that we're sinners by following the, the, the nature and the logic of our body or something like that. Yeah. And, and that is, and then we go both bo back to, if you put it back to postmodernism, it is about being a sinner to following the, the primal instincts of your body. And I can see that also, if I look at my daughter and she gave him birth to this child, just for having a concrete example to to tend to pay attention and to just hold her as a wiser elder woman of listening to her body you know like and there when she started to do that just like day two and day three after the birth she was just like mesmerized of the intelligence that has like thousand and thousand and thousand of years of evolution behind how to keep that baby alive but as soon as she went up to her head and should follow like, no, you should just give your kid food every three and four hour. And the kid was sending signals. No, 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 I want food now. And her body was like, yes, I'm going to give you food. And her mind was saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And I was like, but what does this say? And she was like, it says, do it. What would happen if you follow that? How would that feel for you? And she was like, oh, I'm so good. Trust it. You know, and it's not about, about taking away knowledge. You also to be attending to research and science and so on but you know both yeah both and more 
Yeah. yeah, and I think, but it's good to juxtapose that because I do think, and I think that the example you gave is really good, specifically about, um, you know, following your body's intelligence versus sort of following, you know, like a book that might tell you to feed on a certain time schedule or, or, or something like that, is that in the advent of the scientific world, in some sense, we did learn about our primitive history, you know, like the theory of evolution, that we can we come from the animals and stuff like that. But the paradox of all this is that this very knowledge makes is is artificializes us in some sense, you know, like like at, you know, we don't listen to those thousands of years of wisdom that's just passing through us naturally, you know, like it's 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 a really it's a really weird paradox, I think, but um there in was terms just, of yeah was, go ahead. Just, just like putting this in because you said like what i think you we started this last part of like what would be the man's part of growing like to 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 have what women get by just getting birth and i don't know like one thing that comes up in my system but that's such an old perspective it's like military you know but that's not that because i'm like no <laughs> I'm, but it's like i think it's so well, important for men from an early age to be foster in our culture and our system to give themselves over for something that is bigger than themselves. Like, I, like that could be the group, it could be the society itself, it could be their own purpose, it could like something that is beyond their individual self and their own. Yeah. Yeah, I think well, I think military is is perhaps one avenue where uh you do get a type of um implicit structure where you are serving something bigger than your yourself um mm -hmm. but you know we don't have to essentialize the military uh um i mean it, it could it could be i mean it could simply be being a part of a project or a group whether it's at a university or whether it's at, in a government or whatever it is, but something bigger than yourself where you're really disciplining yourself and going beyond yourself towards, towards the bigger group. And, and ultimately hopefully something that can all also be brought back into the, um, the family or like this distinction between the inner circuit and the outer circuit. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing you said about sort of um, this core energy, which I wanted to bring back to um, sort of attention because um, it's something that I remember being taught, uh, when I was an undergrad in anthropology. Um, I was, yeah, I was an undergrad in anthropology and this distinction between women as gatherers and men as hunters was something that was problematized and deconstructed, of course. Um, but there is something interesting about the logic of, of women as gatherers and men as hunters, which the point I would always make when I was an undergrad was, when people were deconstructing this difference, what I felt was that there was an underlying devaluing of the woman's position. Because like a lot of the women basically said, but women can be hunters too. As if gathering was unimportant or unessential, you know, like unconsciously devaluing it. And like one of the things I did was I looked in the literature about what percentage of the hunter gatherers diet came from hunting or gathering. And the percentage was skewed towards gathering, meaning that 70% of the food was from gathering, berries, nuts, whatever. And 30% of the food was from hunting. So actually a larger, the, the overall point is that, that both of them are extremely valuable. And like, I, I think that when we deconstruct the polarity, what's always going on seems to, or what might be going on in many cases is actually a paradoxical systematic undervaluing of the feminine position um and i'd be wondering if you recognize that i think you sort of alluded to it in some way as sort of affecting um a lot of women who become postmodern feminists is that actually what what it's again a paradox where they think they're asserting a deeper rights and privileges for women but actually they might be going against women or going against sort of like the this natural intelligence of the body in, in, in some way. I think that's a really great point and I, 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 I rela relate and recognize it because what would happen if we allowed ourselves to relax into our natural intelligence? And what if there will be they will be equally valued? And what if we added a third circle? And that's the circle that goes in between. 
that can be both men and women. You could call it binary, you call it androgen. You can also call it men and women who are drawn to uh, the opposite uh, uh, sex and still goes in between. So, so, so we don't have to make it just like two poles, like one, the inner circle, outer circle. Yeah, but what if it was also was a third circle, a circle who went in between these two worlds? Uh, and that was not static, that, that both men and women, both that was binary or androgen, was a part of that circle that was their place. And men and women who needed, for some reason, to go in between. It could be leader position. It could be that the, the, the men and women were specific shamans in the tribe. So it was not related to what, what sexual relationship they had with the other, but actually position in, in the pack. And what would happen in our society if we could take that big out breath and saying, wow, what if men is in service of life to protect and provide life? What is it women are life givers and nurture of life? And what would that collaboration look like from a new standpoint when we have gone through the deconstruction of gender because of we, we did have not equal rights in our society. Because what I, the position I'm coming from, I'm not talking about men and women having different rights in our society. We're all human beings and we should be equally valued, no matter if you're men, women, or the one who walks in between. Uh, so that is one line. But then, but we're standing on that. That's what the whole postmodernist uh, um, deconstruction, one of the things it has been about the freedom of being a human being and being equally valued, no matter of gender, race, or religion, or sexuality, or whatever. But what if the new edge is saying, all right, let's take that, include that, and transcend that, and allowing our natural intelligences <sighs> come at place. So coming back into, uh, and what will happen from there when we can meet from a different point uh, on a foundation that can look like we're looking back 200 years and saying, hey, this is a regression. No, what, what if it's not? What if it's progression? Uh, yeah. But but we cannot, like, as I see, like, <sighs> I see postmodern, like the feminist, like there's a really show out uh, that is, yeah, I more see it as based on trauma right now than actually based on uh, fighting for equal rights. And I'm not saying in any way that we have come to a point that we have equal rights for between men and women all over the world. There is still work to do, but we have to look at the edges where the postmodern in the in the Western society has really come to a peak, and maybe there is, it's a leap that is possible to yeah. take. That's yeah, there's so, so many interesting points there. I think one I would just like echo sort of like the way you're thinking about this geometrically or mathematically with the idea of the third. I think that's so important. I think we do need a third to hold the two. And I mm -hmm. think that that does sort of like help us like get out of like the, the deconstructive mindset because the third is a category that can hold the androgynous identity, which could be transsexual, could be transgender, could be whatever. I mean, it could it's that in-between category where uh, no, there isn't a exact overlap between gender and biological sex. There is a distinction and some people do sort of feel like they're more in between and 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 so that third category I think is essential I think yeah, the other and, thing yeah yeah and Go I just ahead. want to add one thing here because I also like it can sound like because I think this is a value perspective to bring in as well I see myself uh because as a woman of course there is a diversity like of of of, of like uh, like a different types of being a woman as well that's why like no the women's guide is a it's a, like exploration of the 21 womanhood in the 21 century because i also deeply know in my essence i would not feel fulfilled just being a mom and i'm not saying that that undervaluing like just being a mom is not enough it's just being a mom is profoundly meaningful and it one of my greatest life achievements like and life explorations and I am also a woman, a human, who are like, I'm so passionate to pour my life force energy into creation, creating a project or like, like bringing out ideas in the world. And I could, I could notice that already when I was home with my children. I was home for four years 
with my children because I wanted to to create a, a, a different like foundation for them that the society was allowing at the time I was a mother because then you should give your child away in the sweet side when they were the age of one and it wasn't resonating with my worldview and research that I leaned on and my own impulse and so on but and I can see it in my daughter as well like I can see that she is fully uh, there surrendering to this process and she is not that type of woman who can be fulfilled for the rest of her life being a mother. And I know women who are profound mothers and they are, that's what they want to do. And then there are the ones in between, you know, so it's not either off, but I also just want to put that in. So that's not what I'm saying. My, my perspective that I bring is more pointing direction of saying, what if it's time for us to bring in core energies and intelligence in men and women and the one who walks in between so we can come to an edge of something new that wants to be birthed into our culture and our consciousness? So I just want to create that clarity because I think it can be easy to, to hook on that and not hear the deeper layer of what you and I try to speak into. Absolutely. And I think that that's a, a really, I'm glad that you made the point. And I think it, it, it definitely needs to be made is that um, that there is actually something that is necessary about the process of deconstruction, because there are some, there are uh, maybe even the dominant traditional way of uh, interpreting the situation is that um, a, 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 theme, a subject appearing in a female body has the single goal and purpose and utility of becoming a mother and that that sort of exhausts and covers her entire identity and stuff like that and i think of course that's not um what we're trying to say or trying to point towards but that it is often for many women and an essential step in a larger process which is of course not for every single subject that appears in a female body but um, but is is a process for for many women. Yeah, and if we point it back to Nietzsche, like becoming our over <laughs> our over man, <laughs> becoming a mother is a great way of going there because you get so much for free because you get a very clear ego death. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that that actually that that connects really well with like maybe the next thing that that would be interesting to bring up, which is how Nietzsche connects both the marriage and the child to the overman that he actually sees part of um, the idea of the overman, which is of course not exhaustive of every identity, but part of the process of, of the overman does involve um, the type of selflessness and the type of sacrifice that comes with forming a marriage towards reproduction and having many children. And he says, you know, use the garden of marriage for many children and, 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 but, you know, w- one thing I'd like to emphasize that he says is that if you're young, and I think this is, I don't know, I'd be interested to know if you think this message should be tailored differently for men and women, but he says, if you're young and you wish for children and you wish for marriage, he says, do you have the right to wish for a child? Are you a victor? Are you a self conqueror? Are you a master of your senses and a ruler of your virtues? And I think like how I interpret that as a man is actually like, did I have impulses towards having a child and becoming a husband when I was in my early 20s? It existed in my mind, but was I ready for that? Not at all. Um, And actually I would advise men under the age of 25, even if they have that impulse, probably to, to, to wait. Um, and, and do I think I'm currently 36? I don't actually have a wife or a child. Um, but at the age of 36, do I feel like I'm in a psychological space as it relates to my virtue, as it relates to my understanding of my senses, as it relates to my understanding of my desire? Um, do I feel like I'm in a better headspace to become a father and a partner than I would be at like, say 25? A hundred percent um there's no there's no competition there and um just connected to that he says and this is sort of like he gets like i think he really like when you read thus books Zarathustra, he really crawls 
you can you can tell he's really crawled around all the areas of the psyche and like he makes you look at certain things in your psyche that like maybe will take you by surprise he says like when you want children and marriage he says does an animal neediness speak out of your wish does loneliness speak out of your wish does a self discord uh, speak out of your wish so he's really trying to get you to have you confronted your loneliness? Have you confronted the self-discord in your heart? Have you confronted your animal neediness? And once you've done that, he says, then I think you'll make a great parent and then you'll make a great partner. Um, so like what was coming up for you in this meditation on, on these ideas? <laughs> that I agree with him <laughs> very shortly. <laughs> um, yeah, I get to, uh, as I said earlier, I have one daughter and one son, and I can see that in my son. I actually had a conversation with my son today there where I'm like, whoa, he's 24. And I always thought he would be the first one uh, to uh, to become a parent. Uh, and, um, and today was the first time when we talked, I was like, wow, he's actually, actually getting ready. Uh, because I can hear, I could hear some arguments in himself where he's maturing uh, deeply. That he, where he could see, like, yeah, but I, I can't. Like, I was like, wow, you just, you really like because he shared a, a behavior that that he has have had for since he was a young young child, and he doesn't have that anymore. And I was like, oh, how did you do that? That's a quite big thing to change. Uh, and then he was just like, and I was like kidding with him. I was like. How does that play out now in a different way? Because that's such behavior. You don't just change that uh, because it has like, a, it had a little bit like an addictive trait in it. And then it was just like passing and it's like, actually, I just, I have just come to a really deep realization that if I really want to go and get somewhere in the world, I can't keep on doing it. And I was like, whoa, it's like, that's, that's a man talking, you know, that, that's, that's, that he had come to like by deep self-reflection because he's been traveling the world and he's really devoted to a life purpose. So he has a lot of things free because he's all like from the age of 14, he's been giving himself to his purpose. So he's been really like challenging himself and leaving home and traveling far away and really being, yeah, in, in, in hard places, carrying a lot of rocks, you know, to, 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 to give himself for this, what he really believes in. And this was, so even with that practice, and, and he's been doing that since he was six, 16, uh, 16, 17, and now he's 24. And that's, that's a couple of years, like seven years. And now I could hear that it has actually created something in his psychic on a deeper level. So, so that's just a personal example that I agree with what you said. That Because what can happen if we go back to the polarity because it's not that many women becomes a mother for the reason that Nietzsche is pointing at, loneliness, da-da-da. Like, the reason can be the same, but because of the, the, the fabric of pregnancy, birth, and taking care of a baby, a newborn, it will rupture, it will take you somewhere in your psychic. Like, you, you can't get away. It doesn't mean that you will mature into the most like profound part piece of woman, but it will change you. But a man can go through this on um, like uh, as a, a co-partner and get away with not having that development in his psychic. So with that, I, I would say that maybe men should think even twice before they choose becoming a father. And women maybe should think twice when they look at a partner, a chosen partner. Is this really the right timing? And now how controversial would it be for you to say that in the modern education system? Like it, it like on, you know what I mean? Like on the one level, it's like it on the one level, there's an aspect of common sense to it. There's an aspect of intuitive obviousness to it. Um, but on the other hand, because I do think we're living in a society which does not really want to accept and maturely embrace the body as its full developmental process, 
there is a way in which even saying something like that might be seen as taboo or might be seen as, you know, um, sexist, mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah, and I, I can notice I have a little like tension on my back spine because I know that this can be <laughs> deeply misinterpreted, if so to speak. And I also know that I just speak my deepest truth for now and I'm, I'm deeply open that I'm wrong. And then, like, then I will be taught by life because I'm open to listen to different perspectives. Uh, and at the same time, I think it's important to have the courage to voice this because what I do see, and, and again, I challenge me, please, if, but what I do see is what can happen when a man step into fatherhood or marriage too early? Then the woman becomes a mother and the boy, the man becomes a boy in the relationship. And then the polarity is uh, destroyed. And the man, there is hard, like, that, that environment keeps him to be a boy. And then we can keep on playing out this dysfunctional like uh, relationship pattern of women becoming half men and becoming mother and I'm not fully in her feminine power and 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 relating to uh, a, a man. And what does that do to our family systems and our society system and us as men and us as women and to that great collaboration that lays potent under that distorted version of a, a profound collaboration that can happen between a man and a woman. And not just a man and a woman, because I also talk about universal principle of the masculine and the feminine that is within us, between us, uh, and that I see is vital for becoming an uh, uh, overman or superhuman or transcended or more mature uh, yeah. human. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> there's something that was just on the tip of my mind there, and now it's slipped and so it's not going to be immediately recalled by my own mental energy <laughs> but um but yeah just the, okay yeah what i wanted to what i wanted to say was actually when you talk about the conditions in which um a, a, a pair bond a husband and a wife um, a marriage um can fall into this situation where um the woman becomes like a mother and the and the husband becomes like a boy this is like the recreation of like a, a an Oedipal drama, like a, a, a an infantile drama between you know, and 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 I think we have to avoid that on. I think I think we you know from a psychoanalytic perspective, we have to avoid that on on both sides. I think it's true that you can fall into a situation with a mother and a boy, and you could also fall into a situation with a father and a daughter potentially, and 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 maybe that was more common in. Uh, traditional religious society perhaps like where like for example like i remember when i was in cameroon i went to a village where a guy was like 45 marrying a 12 or a 13 year old like to give a really ridiculous example but like that really does happen in a lot of areas of the world and 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 like it's not like child brides and child slavery is is gone but like the point being like in the traditional religious society you might be actually more likely to see this relationship where the husband is like a father to the wife who's like a daughter. And just because of the weirdness of our society and our reality, now it seems to have flipped where now in the postmodern condition, you're more likely to see like a husband and wife where there's a mother and a son. And like, and so like the polarity is all out of whack and like the polarity is just all, all, all messed up. And, and that might be an interesting segue into talking a little bit about how I think Nietzsche introduces the idea um, of polarity. I, I know we had a little email conversation about a very controversial line in Nietzsche where he says, if you go to women, don't forget the whip. Um, and there's like entire academic papers written about this. I sent you an academic paper, which was literally titled, don't forget the whip or something like that. But I think really what he's trying to get at with that is that um, of course, speaking a little bit towards a masculine feminine polarity, like if we want to universalize it beyond like just man and woman, like that that polarity sort of needs to be held. And like in one of the papers we read about that, like one of the ideas was like 
don't forget to like include distance in between the polarity between man and woman. Like you shouldn't fuse into one thing, like, but you should sort of keep a, a, pol a polarity in your relationship. So like I could talk a little bit about how I think about this as it relates to how I sort of like try to ethically conduct my life. But what do you think about um, this principle of um, that? What do you think about this principle that Nietzsche, I think, is trying to get at with don't forget the whip? Basically, he's like trying to create like some maybe domination submission or like trying to create like a sexual charge in some sense, like where you don't fall into like a mother son relationship or you don't fall into a father daughter relationship or something like that. Can you, can you say a bit more? Yeah. Like, I think like, I just think like you were emphasizing like the way in which on our con contemporary society, if a husband, like if a man goes into marriage and fatherhood without being ready for it, he could potentially become like a boy in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And like what I take that to mean is like, he becomes like nurtured and cared for as opposed to like going out there and like, uh, becoming a protector and provider and like submit like or sacrificing himself for something outside of himself and like I think what Nietzsche is trying to get at with the don't forget the whip thing is like basically don't become like a little boy in relationship to women you know like keep keep a distance you want it you want to be seen in some sense as someone who is like what I've heard is like you want to be perceived as like dangerous in a good way like that, like you're, you're, you're someone who could be dangerous, but you're not going to be dangerous to the woman or something like that. Like that's your partner. You put, that's like, if, if the man is a protector, like he has to be dangerous in some sense or else he's not going to be able to protect anything. Mm. Or at least that's some of the ideas that come through my head. Mm. There is a possibility that maybe he's pointing at several different things. Like I have one thing that you're pointing at, you're saying like, just don't become, don't become the boy. But I would also say, don't become the same. Like uh, this, there's like, if, if, if whip is like a symbol for distance uh, and not oppression or a, like, it's like distance, don't become the same because like polarity is there because also of the distance, like that there is an attraction for it in between. So it's also about how can we, how can the man relate to the woman with the distance of the other, like of, of being the other? And how can, how can I, by relating as the other, that distance, how can I more profoundly understand myself? Like uh, how, and and by that understanding myself, how do I more profoundly understand the other? And and by and by and then be able to play with what the relationship in between. So and, and so for me, it's that both of yes, you could say it as becoming a bit dangerous, but you could also call it directedness. You could call it uh, to penetrate with perspective. Uh, with, with like, so it's more. I more see like that 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 sentence. I see both pointing us towards keep the distance and not becoming the other. Uh, I see being a man and a woman. Like if we just talk it out of symbols, it's about merging as well. It's becoming one, like the masculine, and the feminine. Before, if we look at more universal spirituality, just before the masculine, and the feminine. Were divided separated into two there was one <laughs> so it's also what if that is the key to access more uh, oneness or more transcendence or more uh, uh, becoming a yeah a superhuman or uh, overcoming yourself so i don't have like and also What if there is also a perspective that if there is a core energy of protecting um, 
and providing life and being in life giving, nourishing life. Relating to that submissive or like that energy of I'm, I'm submissing myself to you as well. He's also writing something about the love of a woman. Like if you if you love truly, then you love more than the other. And I, I can so deeply relate to that because yeah, it's also that. about because it's about when I deeply trust a man, and fuck it, it takes me like a lifetime to come to that place. Uh, <laughs> the capacity of deeply trusting a man, I'm in a way giving myself my life in his hands. Like I, I give myself to him and I trust his direction. And even if I sometimes can sense he's making the wrong choice. I, I can and I can tell you, like nudge him and say, "Hey, I, I get this." And sometimes, if if everything is right, he listened to that deeper impulse and course direct. Sometimes he's not. Then I just love him through it and trust that we need to go through some kind of death and rebirth for because there is consciousness that wants to come through. There is something in our relating that needs to destabilize or stabilize in a different way. So. My, my, you could say like, I don't know why that, what that, why that word come up because I don't use that word. So my, like my weapon of my heart or my, my gift of my heart, my capacity of love to love does something for us in that, in that dance of, um, yeah. So I. And that is also very much like I, I know you when you sent me some of the paper, the one perspective of interpreting Nietzsche is about BDSM and uh, like the dominant and the submissive. But there is a, I see there's a universal truth uh, in that between a man and a woman and the, like the profound great collaboration of, yeah. And there, I, I think the whip is pointing at something very universal. Um, I'm just going to slow down. I can notice there, there is something coming up. I think she's not. Yeah. It's pointing at something universal. Of like if we say, we, we play with the perspective that as the primal animal the biology in me i give life the primal animal in you you provide and protect life what if there is these core energies are connected to like our possibility to transcend into over man over human and and what if these that's where we that and they are gone into like the polarity of really honoring the dominant and the submissive polarity like that interplay and there could be i receive there is a key to a different dimension i i, I receive there is a key like yeah masculine and feminist both within me but it's also key between a man and a woman when we get that right yeah. there is deep trust deep coherence deep love and life force energy like eros can take us somewhere new perspectives synthesis can come forward direction new direction can be made and i'm not clear enough now but this is really hard for me to word but i like i can touch it <laughs> yeah well let's 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 say like we don't need to have the i it's it, it's a it's a statement that's quite controversial it's elicited much interpretation and i i i and i think that um yeah i mean it's it's interesting the way the way it's resonating for you and the way it's point it's interesting to me that that what what comes to your mind is some pointing towards a universal dimension and maybe something like, for example, it's, it's an example of something like in the course, maybe like we, we, we'd like to spend more time thinking about or, or, or reflecting on. But um, the last, the last um, sort of topic that I think we should bring up is actually um, the importance that Nietzsche gives to marriage. And I think that that might be seen as something which, um, might be seen as like surprising for some, because of course Nietzsche is also known 
um, as sort of like a great anti-Christian and anti-traditionalist in some sense, but he really does like have a have a type of ode for marriage in 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 thus spoke Zarathustra, and he he calls marriage a will by two for creating the one who is more than those who created it. So he's really linking marriage to the child, and he's really linking the marriage to sort of like this garden for many children, let's say. And and I think there's something to be said for that for like two mature adults who have managed to figure out or to find some sort of harmony in their sexual polarity to really dedicate themselves to that task. I think like maybe to give it a more universal context is like in Nietzsche's philosophy, he has this idea of the camel, the lion and the child as the spiritual metamorphoses, which happens within oneself. So like, for example, like actually you pointed towards it in your own son where the camel is something which carries something really heavy. So like they, you know, the camel, the camel is the spirit of discipline. The camel is the spirit of, of, of dedication, of hard work, of carrying something heavy for something heavy's sake. The lion is, is the, the spirit which searches out uh, its true desire and tries to become a master of its desire and tries to really understand, you know, like what, what it is, do I want what it is? Do I really want to direct my sexual energy towards? It could be, or what? What do I really want to direct my arrows towards? Could be one way to think about the lion. And then the child is like this innocent yay saying, which like can see the world as if for the first time all the time. You know, like it's just this innocent looking at the world of like in wonder and beauty and like you like every day you're born. You know, like every day is your birthday in some sense. Like this is what I get from the child. And so like, I want to situate those spiritual metamorphoses in the context of what he's talking about for marriage, which is that it's the will by two for creating the one who is more than those who created it, the child. And, and it's like, it's like, basically, you are carrying a heavy load, you have, you know, the marriage is something you're carrying, in some sense, more than yourself. And you've also hopefully figured out the desire, like the lion spirit within your marriage, which is to build the polarity. And then that's ultimately to serve the one that that's more important than both of you. And I think that's why you need that, that maturity. But what do you sort of think about the, these ideas and the way he's trying to, to frame it? Because I do think in some sense, marriage gets a bad rap sometimes and, and often can be seen as like in contradiction to searching for your deepest desires and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I know okay. you've like ha said words like sacred union before and stuff. Like that. Yeah. The first thing that comes up uh, when you say what you say is like, yeah, marriage. What if that's a container, uh, like something that's concealed something, like hold something together. Uh, and what if, you say like he points at having a child, but what if it's like he's pointing at two becoming more? Like, what if that's like a container for spirit? Like, uh, and uh, many children. What if he's like, what if it's just a metaphor for how we can transcend uh, to embody spirit uh, for many children, for humanity, for for like for more than just like the the family a union. Uh, so it, it evokes and evokes for me that he's pointing at something that is uses the marriage and family and child to point at a spiritual transcendence. Um, and uh, I just get also my very concrete, my own life journey, and, and that's just a way of speaking it on a more concrete level. Like I have... I have in my life journey uh, uh, 18 year 18 18 years of mono monogamy marriage in my life story and then I have had a journey of I don't know at least 8 years of exploring open relating and polyamory and polysexuality and just like understanding pleasure and desire and relationship beyond monogamy and marriage and so forth and I can just see, it's almost like how 
the process or the journey is unfolding depending on my own psychic development and spiritual maturity of coming back into um sacred monogamy a marriage it's just like or if we go back to chastity it's just like um i could i can just see how i have been coming back from chastity of just having a suppressed sexuality and believing that i need to be like the madonna to be loved uh and and moving through finding my sexuality and then going through um a very postmodern way of burning man living out all my desires and really deconstructing everything that i thought was me in the sexual area uh, and then finding how my psychic and my consciousness is just developing into either greater depth and I cannot move around in the way I could 10 years ago because my system says no spiritual hygiene choose very specific energies choose to channel your life force in a very specific way um the depth of having a marriage a container can take you deeper and higher and wider than having many and so, so it's just like it, for me it just seems so resonant like with how I can just see how the life journey of my own developmental experience just brought me to the ideas that Nietzsche is presenting also. So, and then if I look at, you can, you can go through the camel, the lion and the child in the marriage. It doesn't have to happen with outside that container. It's, it's about being a living organism together in that marriage. And that is, as he he's, he's so beautifully says in his sentence, um, like two people becoming more than one. It's really to attend, to, re to be receptive to each other's developmental stages and responding to what needs to be responded to and attuned to it. And so I, I, you can go through that journey within that container. You can go that through, through that journey without that container. Um, I, I also and, like, I also like, I, I particularly appreciated the way you were emphasizing the metaphorical dimension of what he's talking about as it relates to uh, this doesn't need to just be interpreted as like, a man and a woman actually having children it could also be a spiritual sense of like a matrix like a, a of like a really um matured man and woman or masculine and feminine energy who are holding tribe or who are holding you know spiritual children in in some some sense um you know like i think you know you've had some experience like with at the nordic women's gathering um i've sort of had some experience with the men's gathering where you know we are playing with these energies of father, mother, and child, which extend beyond their biological representation, in, in, or at least their reductionist biological um, interpretation. I think that's an interesting way to approach it. Yeah, and also if you if you also look at if you also look at where we where I see <clears throat> an edge we are at. If I look at like processing with the Otto Scharmer's processing in theory, U lab. Like if I look at uh, Rhea Beck's uh, collective processing, if I look at Thomas, Thomas Steiniger and Elizabeth DeVault's Emerge Dialogue, if I look at John Vivecki's uh, Dialogues, uh, like there are different, my own work with intersubjective facilitation, it seems that we as humanity walking the edge of new skills, you could call it avatar skills, superhuman skills, overman skills, to really deeply be able to have this innocence, as you said, like awe and wonder every moment, death and rebirth and, 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 and birth, be able to pay attention what's truly between us. Like the life force energy is between us. So what is the creativity that lays between groups, that lays between a couple, uh, that lays between you and life. What will happen when we we start to respond to that energy? 
Uh, so, so I receive also Nietzsche is pointing at skills of the overman by using metaphors as man and woman and marriage and, and so on, because maybe that was the language of the time where people could relate as Jesus were using a, me a metaphoric language that fishermen can relate to. So, uh, yeah, so, so I, I'm... Mm. I'm really, really impressed with your interpretation skills. And I also think it's like, it's, 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 it's like, it, it really says something about, um, like, you don't necessarily need to um, do a doctorate in Nietzsche, or do a doctor, I mean, any thinker you're interested in, like, you don't need to do a doctorate to have like, interesting interpretation that can be connected back to your life. Like you just confronted this text, like for the first time, right? Like in the last few weeks. And like, I think your interpretations are super interesting. So like, I, I think it's, it, it, it says something for, for the, for the, like for the people out there who are listening now, who might be like daunted or, or um, might be intimidated by the idea of like confronting like a, a text like Gus Book Zarathustra or Nietzsche's work or, or other philosophers work. Like, I think, I think it really says something like to, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to challenge yourself in that way. Cause I think it can be, everyone can sort of make, their own interpretations of these texts and bring them into the, the concrete aspects of their own life and, and just relate to it back to your personal story and where you are. Mm -hmm. So I think like this would be a, a good place to like um, close up the conversation, but like, I'd like to also give you the space to let any of the viewers know about like what you're working on, where they can find you, what you're, you know, what, what, you know, what's alive for you right now, maybe like a, a final message you'd like to leave people with, but this has been a really interesting conversation. I'm really, really happy we had it. Mm, yeah, thank you, me too. And and yeah, like, uh, that is actually one thing I would, I would like to end there maybe. Um, it's like, you know this where we started out, you said this like, uh, he points at the body, you know, like love your your body is the spirit, and and also this separation that we very often have between people who are more in the body and people who are in the thinking and philosophy. It goes for thinking, and and I can see in in a lot of spiritual communities there is a rejection, like through uh, towards thinking, uh, and and for me when I was reading Nietzsche, like uh, uh, just rereading it like today, for me it was so in my everyday, very ground foundation of just like taking Nietzsche and just having that when I have listened to my daughter's conversation with me, ongoing conversation for five months. And I was like, yep, yep. <laughs> and I don't say I make the right interpretation, but it was valuable and interesting. And it's like, and that's one thing that I really adore with your work and honor you for is that how philosophy can be more uh, everyday and mainstream understanding like to take it very concrete in your everyday living because like art comes first to really be able to braille the new ideas that enters a society and then the philosophy comes second and the art artist and the philosopher are very closely connected to trying to interpret the new ideas that is forming the next society and by bringing out both old ideas that we maybe haven't been able to uh, integrate and access and embody yet because maybe now the time is ready. I, I think there is so much value in that and also in one way I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from a humble place, I'm not seeing myself as a philosopher at all and at the same time I do have a deep embodied experience of life uh, and life in itself is a place who takes us deep within our own psychic and our divine nature and, and, and primal nature. So traveling deep enough in, in, in life comes that you that's philosophy. <laughs> uh, and then what I notice by great thinkers is that they are actually very deep and embodied. They are, they are very deep embodied and they have just this tool of thinking have taken that to a level of like a dancer who's using the whole body as as a profound tool of, of, of bringing something out and and I just think that's 
another separation that I would just like to invite us to. How can we, how can we embrace even deeper the different aspects of being human and not creating like opposite or separation between them, but seeing it for what, what it truly is. So, yeah. So, I don't, and if I'm going to say something about myself, it's just like I, I, I am deeply curious uh, and devoted to explore and investigate and practice what it means to truly live from the evolutionary impulse of errors and lead from that place and speak from that place and create from that place and dialogue from that place. I think we are at the point in our consciousness development and if I point it back to Nietzsche, maybe that's what he pointed as, as the overman. That we are at the possibly at the point where we're gonna go back to to integrate the indigenous wisdom, like the indigenous culture, that we're very connected to nature and able to follow signs and synchronicity and flow, and we're more holistic and more psychic as being. And that doesn't mean to throw out anything that has come after. It's just bringing a piece of us back into what we all have already have and bringing that forward. Um, and that's not the only, like, in, so in the masculine, feminine, men and women collaboration, I see it probably as a part of it. Yeah, I think. I love that. Yeah. Love that. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so it's, it's been, it's been, uh, a, a really interesting conversation for me as well. And I like this idea that you're leaving us with in terms of, um, philosophy needs to be connected to the concrete, needs to be connected to everyday life. Um, and your, your mission, which I think is actually kind of Nietzschean in some sense, which is just to connect back to the evolutionary impulse and to connect back to the, the, you know, connect back to arrows. I think that's very much and the way you express it and the way you you've interpreted it is i think a gift for all of us and i think the people in the live chat here are, are loving it so thank you so much for being as open as as you've been um and sharing as much as you have it's just been tremendous tremendous wisdom and i think that everyone who's listened so far has has benefited um and i'll just say as a, as a closing note um that this has been part of a larger dialogue series called the nietzsche dialogues which is um, all in preparation for a course, which is going to be uh, starting on uh, July. Well, at least the last sign up day at the moment is July 15th. Um, and it will be a, a nine week course where we'll be having six deep dives into Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra is a text which has influenced the 20th century in profound ways and in many different dimensions, everything from theology to um, social theory to political movements to ideas about sexual difference as we discussed today um and this will be the second course that's been offered by philosophy portal we covered uh, hegel's phenomenology of spirit uh throughout the first half of uh this year and the course led up to a collective student-led conference and it'll be the same thing for the uh, course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra will really be trying to organize everything towards creating our own work and creating our own interpretations for the present moment. Um, and I think it is part, uh, as, as Pamela was saying, art comes first, exploring new ideas, and philosophy comes second in terms of really trying to get a conceptual understanding of those ideas. Um, and that's absolutely essential for building out the foundations for a new society and a new way of thinking about the world, especially in an age which is so different from our evolutionary past. And at the same time, the paradox being we need to bring that evolutionary impulse that Pamela talks about into this new environment. So I think that's very much a part of this project we're going to be doing with Dust Folk Zarathustra. So thank you very much, Pamela, for, for coming on here and having this conversation. And uh, thank you to everyone who listened. So we'll sign yeah, off here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the possibility. Thank you.